And welcome back to Energy 808, the cutting edge on a given Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel here on Think Tech, and we have Tam Hunt with us. He joins us from the Big Island, and he's an energy lawyer. Welcome to the show, Tam. Thank you. So um, what is it to be a, a, an energy lawyer these days, uh, especially on the Big Island? Can you give us a little precis of who you really are? <laughs> yeah, well, I've been a lawyer lawyer now for almost 20 years and in the last 15 years I've focused entirely on renewables. So I'm a rare, rare lawyer that gets to um, make a living doing things I believe in fully and that are you know, entirely beneficial for the environment. That means for me a mix of um, about half working on regulatory policy at various utility uh, dockets, mostly in California at the California Public Utilities Commission I also help some solar developers and EV charging developers uh, get permits, uh, get connected to the grid, um, that kind of thing. So it's a nice mix of regulatory and contractual and environmental law. Yeah, sounds great. So uh, are you making any progress these days? I remind you that we have COVID going on. We have an um, uh, economic crash. Or, yeah, you've heard, yeah. <laughs> it's After a while, it's going to dawn on all of us. Um, and we have right. an economic crash going on. And, and then, of course, in California, we have wildfires going on. All those things don't really play well with the development of renewable energy, do they? They don't, for the most part. There's certainly some benefits, um, you know, not very long-lived benefits. So, for example, people staying home um, is leading to a near-term drop in greenhouse gas emissions. This, though, is not going to last. Obviously, this pandemic will be gone. We'll probably roar back economically and probably have even more emissions. So those who are celebrating the near-term dip, I think, are being excited. What it does do, unfortunately, is really sets back initiatives like mass transit, um, taxis, car sharing, because these kind of effects will be for years to come in terms of diminished public ridership. And that's really worrying for me. Well, you know, uh, just to, before we get into the specific initiatives uh, we were going to talk about on the Big Island, I, I do want to mention that I saw an article in the Times this morning about how young people, you know, the young voters especially, are somehow becoming sensitized to climate change now. Uh, it's dawning on them that we have a serious problem. Maybe it's the wildfires. Maybe it's, a, it's the extreme weather in, in the Caribbean. Um, but but the but the article stood for the proposition. I'm sure there was some evidence there um, that um, pe people are starting to realize that that is a an important platform uh, point. And I guess uh, if you want to look at the two presidential candidates, it's really not a platform point for uh, uh, Donald Trump, but it is a platform point, and maybe an increasingly important platform point uh, for Joe Biden. What, what about that? It is, yeah. Um, Joe Biden's got a great initiative actually looking to spend $2 trillion over four years on climate change mitigation and associated green tech and climate tech. And um, this is actually a really far-sighted plan he's put forth. It actually has some you know, great, it's in a, I wrote a summary I can share with your listeners if you'd like to send a link to them. Um, as for young voters, yeah, it really is actually a, a, a bankable issue um, a running issue. And I had to give a little plug for a show I watched recently on Netflix, which really is pretty inspiring and kind of fun. It's called The Politician. It's actually about a very young politician who runs first for a high school office and then he evolves into running for um, state senate in New York. And his main campaign plank is climate change. This show is meant to appeal to young voters. And it really is actually, I think, resonating in a real way that the planet is being uh, despoiled, to say, to say the least, by the older generation leaving you know, a big mess for the younger generation to take care of. That's not cool. Yeah, we, you know, we've, been, we've uh, received a commission, so to speak, a, a grant to make some movies about the relationship of climate change um, and COVID, how COVID affects climate change, and it does simply because of the different level of emissions, and how climate change affects COVID, which is an interesting sort of um, you know, biosphere kind of analysis. So uh, we're into that. We all have to be into that. And certainly, I think uh, when the Definitely. Democrats 
as and when the Democrats, um, you know, get back in in in, uh, in the White House, uh, they'll be they'll be the Green New Deal somewhere along the line, even if they're not completely some enforcing point, it. Sure. Yeah. Well, let's talk mm -hmm. about uh, the things that you wanted to discuss. One is the Green Conservation Corps in Hawaii. Uh, whoops, that's not in the right sequence, is it? Well, let's talk about it anyway. The Green Conservation Corps That's fine. in Hawaii County, uh, the, a net zero energy. What is that? How does it work? And why do you want to talk about it? Yeah, so we have um, a local initiative we're calling um, Think Big on the Big Island. And big stands for Big Island Green. And um, what we're looking at is really combining uh, um, the obvious you know, depression level unemployment issue uh, we're currently facing the Big Island with the already existing urgent need to address climate change and recognizing that, look, we can and should see this as an opportunity to create local jobs, paying jobs that put in place more roofed up solar on county facilities, on carports, et cetera, puts in place EV charging stations, improve energy efficiency in buildings, builds new trails, maintains trails, builds new recreation facilities, uh, maintains existing rec facilities, um, all across the board, just like the Civilian Conservation Corps that was enacted by Roosevelt back in the 30s, that was actually quite successful in creating you know, good jobs for a lot of young men. The new version, of course, in our century is men and women, but doing um, not only trail maintenance, et cetera, but really focusing on climate mitigation. And our view is this could in fact be a real um, serious job creator on the Big Island and statewide and achieve some really great you know, improvements in quality of life. So right now we're um, pushing this at the county level and trying to coordinate with state level groups. And we have some early support from the county council. And we of course are gonna have to wait for funding. This will be an expensive measure. And we're gonna have to wait for funding to come from probably the federal government, hopefully before the election, but um, I'm pretty sure after the election that will happen if um, President Biden comes in. And so we're really trying to lay the groundwork for this idea to get people you know, aware and excited about the potential here to create new jobs that really can do great things. That's a wonderful idea, actually. Uh, uh, and I am immediately reminded of FDR's uh, Civilian Conservation Corps, is that what it was? The, the Triple C, mm -hmm. uh, back in the, in the middle and late yeah. 30s. And it was uh, a very important um, initiative to deal with um, you know, the the lingering depression, which was still going on in that period of time. <clears throat> and uh, certainly we, you know, in Hawaii, we have to remake our economy, reimagine it, and we have to offer jobs and we have to move on from jobs that are no longer available. We can't, we can't re return to the yeah. old normal. This would be uh, a new idea, a new normal. Exactly, yeah. And I mean, people I think are still not quite in turn analyzing the degree of job destruction we've seen in Hawaii and are going to continue to see. Uh, um, it's been masked, of course, by pretty generous federal unemployment benefits, but those ended a month ago. I think people are going to start really feeling the pain quite soon, and we really need to get ahead of the curve here and get people working, doing productive things. And this is really a way to transform our local economies in a way that I think very few people can argue with. Oh, I totally agree. Uh, of course, the problem, as you identified it, is where do you get the money to pay the people to do the work? Um, right now, the government is in dire straits in Hawaii. We're way below the curve. Um, and the federal government uh, under Trump is really not offering any money to the states for this kind of thing. Um, in fact, I'm, I think that's kind of stuck in general right now. And so um, the big question will be raising money. Do you think there's any money available for the private sector? Well, I think this has to be a mix of public and private sector funding. Um, you know, I don't know the landscape in terms of philanthropy that well in Hawaii, but I do know there are some great groups um, funded in large part by some fairly wealthy individuals who certainly could, and I think should, step up and help to fund this kind of initiative. Um, I think if we can get a match of federal funding with local philanthropy, we can get a lot of jobs created in the near term, and this could be rolled out. There's, you know, there's already models um, in the islands for this kind of program. It's really a matter of scaling it up and getting people on the ground to manage it, get people trained, get it rolled out. So I think if we get the framework in place in the next month or two, 
once funding becomes available from the feds and local, hopefully, you know, philanthropic matching funding, it can be rolled out fairly quickly. Well, totally consistent with the, the whole thing about connecting with the land. Um, <clears throat> the whole Hawaiian culture thing um, is consistent with this. So I really hope you can do it. Are you, are you pushing this? Are you active in making it happen? Yeah, we have um, some early support from the county council here in Hawaii. And, and uh, we're hoping to get a resolution before the full council before, you know, I think in September is the plan. And I'm optimistic they'll all vote yes. That then expresses the county council's support for the measure, for the program itself. When funding becomes available, hopefully the next few months, uh, then it could be you know, set up fairly quickly. And so it's too soon to say it will actually happen and what time frame, but I'm optimistic it, it will happen in some form. You know, and it hopefully goes, become a measure for a model for our statewide funding in the same way. I was just going to say that it's a model, it creates a model as the Big Island often does on things like this. Um, and so if it works, if it's doable on, on, on Hawaii Island, well, maybe the other islands will take note. Uh, pe people, exactly. people would warm to it, I think, everywhere in the state. And, and of course, then, then it becomes a model for the mainland too. Might even be a model for the federal government, you know, shades of FDR. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, okay. even Trump could see some benefit here. Well, let's not get carried away, actually, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was so, but that's not likely. Okay, let's talk about the, the Think Big initiative for the Big Island. That big with a capital B, capital I, capital G. Uh, what is that? How does it, how does it yeah. differ from the yeah. Conservation Corps? Yeah, so Think Big is an overarching um, initiative looking at five different areas. So uh, green energy, um, solid waste, education, parks and trails, and local ag being a really important fifth one. And so what I just mentioned, of course, is um, kind of an, it goes to a lot of those different factors um, in terms of the Green Conservation Corps. Um, a second major initiative we're pushing is a county council net zero by 2030 initiative. And it would be a bill uh, that the county council would adopt that would commit itself to achieving a 100% renewables by 2030 for its own use. And that's a key distinction. I'm not saying that the county should necessarily adopt a 2030 goal for the whole county to become fully renewable. That's doable, but I think, you know, let's take this step by step. So if the county itself steps up and says, look, we can do this in the next 10 years, and we should, there's a lot of reasons to do it. We currently have a statewide 2045 mandate for the state to become fully renewable. But is of course an increasing amount of science showing that that's not fast enough. You know, it still sounds really fast to a lot of people, 25 years to transform them fully renewable. But frankly, given the you know, magnitude of the issues we're facing in terms of unemployment, climate change, et cetera, uh, we really need to think a bit bigger, hence the name, think big. And so the county is looking to um, adopt this measure for its own needs and thereby inspire the, the private sector to do the same. Well, you know, it's, a, it's the whole thing about how, whether government likes it or not, government sets the pace, sets the tone. Government, um, I'm not sure how to put this, but government does lead people. If I, if I give you a president, for example, even if he's not a good president, people listen to him anyway. If I give you a governor or a mayor, he's the governor or the mayor or she, and people listen to him anyway. Um, and so if the county, the Big Island County, stops a program like this, it's clear to me that people will see this as a leadership act and it will have an effect beyond government, that this will affect the whole county anyway and maybe other people outside the county who are watching the county. So I suspect uh, just as, a, as a, an elected leader has a leadership effect, like it or not, the county, if it does this, um, it, will, it will be a statement. It will be a, a nod to developers and to environmentalists and to you know, people who care about the environment, keep, people who care about uh, green energy. Don't you think so? It will. That's our, that's our hope. I do, for sure. Yeah. And the key thing we're um, discussing and highlighting in our advocacy is we don't want just a statement and 
um, a vague goal. This bill we're promoting uh, will, if passed, actually have a requirement that the county R&D research and development create a report, an action plan, showing how the goal can be met by 2030, milestones along the way, and metrics. So it's not simply, hey, sure, let's do this at some point in the future. It's really, you know, going to be an action plan with real goals and real metrics and real milestones. Yeah, that's that will be inspirational. It. It will show, you know. From the aspirational goals we've seen so far, you know, let's do 100% by 2045 or 2040 or like that, <clears throat> without any detail. You have to have a detailed plan. You have to know which foot is going exactly. first. Exactly. Um, so yeah. that's, that's and making it by way. 2030. That's a that's a ten that's a ten year plan. That's not tomorrow, but it's not so far in the future that you can simply see it as being a generational challenge. It's a here and now challenge, but with a decade to achieve it. So you know, not to be too, um, you know, self-aggrandizing, but it's kind of like a local moonshot for the county. You know, 20, 10 years <laughs> is long enough to really do something significant, but not, you know, it's not so near term that it's crazy. It's actually quite doable. So what are the, uh, what are the steps forward? In other words, what are the, what are the benchmarks along the way? What happens first and how long does that take? What happens second? How long does that take? Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of logistics, Six, uh, we have a draft bill. Uh, we have a champion in the council who is going to introduce it fairly soon. I won't name the person just yet. Um, once the bill is introduced, um, hopefully the council as a whole passes it before too long. Then it will go to R&D to create the action plan. In our draft we have until the end of 2021 to produce an action plan. That will have milestones for 2025, 2028, and 2030 to achieve these goals. And so we don't want to be too prescriptive in requiring certain percentages by those dates. We'll leave it to R&D and the community-based process to figure out those actual details. Um, in drafting legislation, as I have done for years now, the key is always to be specific, but not too specific. Because if you're too specific, you can easily uh, face problems in terms of um, you know, pushback or just not knowing enough. Because frankly, you know, a big with this, we're not on the ground in R&D's shoes. We are not maintenance people for county facilities. We don't know the details, but we do know enough to be able to put out a, an ambitious but achievable goal like this and then let the people who are on the ground create the details. Who are those, who are those people? <clears throat> Is there a designation in the bill about who would uh, deploy it, who would implement it? Well, in terms of the plan, Planning process, um, research and development is currently run by Dan Lay and Riley Saito. And uh, we've been discussing discussions with them for a few months now about these you know, various measures we're promoting as a think group. Um, in terms of the actual on the ground implementation of the action plan, it will focus primarily on rooftop solar, onsite battery storage, improved energy efficiency through better lighting technologies, uh, better AC where there's AC in buildings, and the key piece, probably the hardest piece, is fleet turnover to uh, purchase um, EVs, primarily electric vehicles. Um, across the board, electric vehicles are by far the most efficient kind of technology out there. And they're becoming increasingly affordable, increasingly long range. If you can charge your EV fleet with on-site solar power, it's quite cheap. If you charge your EV fleet with grid power, it's quite expensive. So a virtuous cycle here. If you go big on solar, you can also go big on EV fleets and save money. So the whole plan will cost money to do it, but it will save money long term through fuel savings. Well, when you talk about EVs, are you including hydrogen? Riley uh, uh, Sato, Sato <clears throat> has been very um, helpful in terms of developing hydrogen buses in the, in the Big Island in a way that um, would be a model for other islands. Uh, He's a real hero in that regard. But query, when you talk about electric vehicles, are you talking about hydrogen as well? I'm more of an EV fan than a hydrogen fan. There's a big difference in efficiency and there's been a big debate in the last few years about the efficiency differences, technology comparisons. I personally prefer to see uh, fully e-fleets. I accept there are some use cases where hydrogen may make sense, but the efficient differential is about three times uh, more efficiency for EVs. That's a big hurdle to overcome. Hmm. 
Okay. Well, the other thing is the money. You know, as as in the case, in our discussion around the conservation core, what about the money for this? How much does this cost? Is it um, you know, is it going to be hard to fund it? How is it going to be funded? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, the action plan will certainly include analysis of what it will cost. So I. I don't want to give a fair at this point. I recognize fully there will be some pretty hefty capital costs to go big on solar, e charging, mm -hmm. EV fleets. Um, but I know enough from my own analyses over the years and reading, you know, dozens of other related reports that the fuel savings from these measures pay for the capital costs before too long. And a key source of savings I already mentioned in Hawaii, if you can basically, you know, decouple from the electric grid and very high electric costs by going solar. Uh, on your own facilities, you then can translate those cost savings to the whole um, energy infrastructure, including not only on-site electricity use, but also the EV fleet use. Uh, that will, I know enough now to say with some confidence, pay for the whole thing within, you know, probably a last decade. Hmm. No, so it may would... matter of, you know, getting the upfront capital cost to, to that's not an easy lift, um, but there are many sources of funding for that kind of thing. Um, state is broke right now. We won't go there, but certainly some federal funding will be available for this kind of thing. Um, there is certainly various kinds of uh, private funding, um, hopefully available in some manner. Uh, and we're also hopeful that there will be a community block grant funding for this kind of thing too. I heard you talk about getting off the grid in, in, this, uh, in, in the details of this plan. And I don't know if you noticed, but there's a, there's a, there's a bestseller coming out on Amazon called something just like that, getting off the grid. And uh, it could be this is part of COVID. It could be this is a, a part of getting away from the madding crowd that people are interested these days in getting off the grid, perhaps more than they were. Um, and, and of course, the Big Island is a perfect place for that, just in terms of the, the space of it and the fact that it costs a lot of money to connect to the grid. So how about spending that on developing your own infrastructure you know, in a microgrid? <laughs> but where, where is Definitely. that? Where does that play in, in the Big Island initiative you're talking about? Yeah, well, microgrids um, is, is kind of the catch-all term here. And microgrids can be either um, their own disconnected grid or they can be connected to the larger grid. In this case, we'd want the best of all worlds. You'd want to have basically the ability to operate as a local microgrid but still have the larger grid to fall back on and to interact with. If you have excess power you can't store on site, you want to be able to send it to the grid through net metering or related policies, but you also want to use as much um, of your own power generated locally as you can. So in this case, when I talk about installing large amounts of rooftop solar, we want to see basically all county buildings become effectively microgrids with solar power and onsite battery storage and local EV chargers and charge as many fleet vehicles as you can from that onsite solar microgrid of, you know, policy. Um, I work on microgrid policy for a nonprofit client in California called the Green Power Institute. And there's a lot of incentive now in California, especially to develop islandable microgrids because of all the wildfires and the power shutoffs. Um, we don't have quite the same situation in Hawaii by any means, but there are still uh, big financial incentives to become your own grid effectively in Hawaii. And a lot of people are doing that, of course, for years now. We've seen a huge um, you know, growth in rooftop solar. We have the highest solar penetration in the nation uh, for obvious reasons. We have very expensive power. And so in the same way that going solar um, at your home or business makes sense in Hawaii, you know, a lot of sense financially, it makes a lot of sense for uh, local governments to do the same. How does this affect uh, the relation of the, um, I want to say, ratepayer, user, consumer, and, and the utility, Helco, on the Big Island? How, how would that be changed, if at all? Yeah, well, in this case, you know, when I talked about the best of all worlds, um, having both um, microgrid being connected to the grid still, um, you are not um, affecting the larger grid, except by diminishing the amount of power you draw from the grid. And so it does not negatively impact um, other rate payers because you're just going to be still paying, you know, some T and D um, part of your power bill. You're simply not paying the same generation bill. And so mm -hmm. Hawaii is partially decoupled in terms of its revenue for utilities uh, being decoupled from power sales. 
uh, California is fully decoupled. So they actually don't make money on power sales, they make money on infrastructure. Hawaii is kind of a blend of the two. Um, so we should go toward full decoupling here in Hawaii to remove that incentive to sell power as a revenue stream. It should be instead fully um, infrastructure based. Hmm. <clears throat> Are you familiar with any jurisdiction which is using performance based uh, rate making or maybe that hasn't really happened anywhere but here? Yeah, well, Hawaii is leading the charge in that. You know, I've not been involved in that docket here in Hawaii, but I'm looking forward to it being finished and rolled out. It could be a real model for the rest of the country. Yeah. Well, you know, one thing that strikes me is that uh, some of the elements of, of these plans, I'm sure you've thought about this, They're the conservation plan and also the BIG initiative, the Big Island, uh, and, um, you know, the 100% renewables by 2030. Um, doesn't at least some of that require P PUC approval? Um, no, uh, the two things I've talked about today will not require PSC approval. Um, the county can, of course, you know, do what it wants in terms of going solar and buying EVs and, uh, you know, implementing a county imposed mandate to go 100% is purely a county measure. Uh, no PSC required for that. The GCC, the Green Conservation Corps, is a jobs program, so no PSC approval required for that. Yeah, good. Well, that makes it easier, I suppose. Uh, from and you know, mm -hmm. you're you're a lawyer that deals with regulators. That's really an important consideration. Um, why and why the Definitely. Big Island, though? I mean, I, I I personally love the Big Island, and I I understand why anybody would rather be there than any other place in the state. But query why the Big Island for you and for this initiative? Well, I live here. That's a short answer. <laughs> you know, I want to start local and, um, you know, create good programs that work locally and then hopefully see them grow and, you know, other places too. Is it, is it better suited than the other islands? Well, in terms of local production, for sure. Yeah, we're much bigger. Um, and in terms of, you know, meeting the state mandate, 100% um, renewables by 2045, we are on our way um, with the mix of, um, we're going to have a lot of large scale solar installed next few years. We have some wind already. We have some geothermal, which is currently down. Uh, we have a lot of rooftop solar. So we definitely have the space uh, to go fully renewable here. Um, and, you know, Oahu does too for most of its needs. Um, being much more dense, it's more tricky. And of course, being a much smaller island, you know, a great fact, I'm sure you know this, the big island is twice as big as all the other islands combined. So it's a, it's a lot bigger, a lot more space. But a lot of it is, you know, um, taken up with conservation um, area, which is that's a good thing. We also have a lot of completely unused lava land, which could be used for solar and that kind of thing too. So we definitely oh, yeah. are, we are the low hanging fruit for going 100% renewable in the islands for sure. Uh, are the people, uh, you think, you know, the way they see the, the land, the environment, renewables, uh, uh, are, they, uh, are they likely to be amenable to the elements of these plants? Well, solar so far has received almost no pushback, as I'm sure you've heard. Wind power on Oahu and other islands has been, you know, a real controversial topic. Uh, uh, there is wind here, South Point, and of course Kohala, but it's been no uh, new large wind facilities proposed on the island for a long time. So it's all been um, solar for new projects. And to date, I've seen or heard nothing about, you know, major concerns or even minor concerns about solar. It's just a very, you know, low impact technology. I think if we go to the point where we're exporting solar power from the big island, that will be an issue. But for now, there's no plan to export it. It's simply about being used, you know, on our island. And the last thing I'd like to discuss with you, Tim, is uh, <clears throat> the whole thing about lawyers. You know, the project you described really, really does need lawyers like, like you. Uh, it does need people who can draft legislation that would work, who have some experience who can appreciate you know, the vagaries of regulation. Um, and of course, contracts in all directions uh, to, make, to make the developments work. Um, I mean, you and I could sit down and I'm sure you've done this and, and think of all the contracts you would write in order to implement all the, the plans involved in this initiative. It's a matter of, it's a matter of writing legal papers. And, um, and there you are. I, I don't know if there's another lawyer in all of the Big Island who can say that he's a, uh, a green energy lawyer? Maybe there, maybe there are, I'd like to know that. But don't you think that we need more lawyers who can facilitate 
the development of clean energy in Hawaii, who dedicate their practice to it, who dedicate their lives to it. Don't you think so? Definitely. Yeah. And like I said earlier, you know, I feel pretty lucky uh, to have been able to carve my niche. Um, and definitely we need more people who do what I do. You know any candidates? Well, I'm not, uh, well, I want to talk about that for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, are you going to be able to, uh, you know, practice in, in the mainland and do this here? Because, I mean, uh, practicing in the mainland is demanding. I mean, I know a lawyer who actually uh, lives here and practices in Philadelphia, believe it or not. No problem. Mm -hmm. Partner in a big firm in Philadelphia, full-time practice, but she lives here. Um, and so the same, mm -hmm. I, I suppose, it's really not an obstacle for you to practice in California and live here. I mean, we do have the internet and that makes it easy. Uh, we do, yeah, and an irony of the uh, pandemic is that it's actually become easier to um, work remotely, you know, unsurprisingly. Um, I've worked remotely for the most part for years before the pandemic too. Um, even in Santa Barbara, I worked mostly remotely. Um, my, my work at the California PUC is sent in San Francisco, but most of those meetings are uh, webcast anyway. And there's certainly pros and cons about being, you know, in person versus Zoom. Um, you can get a lot more done when you're there in person, but, you know, I've made it work for many years now. So to be clear, my, my clients are all based in California currently. Um, my work in Hawaii is purely voluntary. It's all volunteer work. I'm on the board of the statewide EV association, the new Hawaii EV association. I created this new Think Big initiative with various like-minded people. Um, I do some other volunteer activities. So to me, it's really a matter of being able to turn my skill set into an asset for my community um, in a way that is, um, you know, the best thing I can do with my limited, you know, volunteer time. And so I will be taking the bar here in Hawaii before too long and become a uh, bar certified in Hawaii, but currently I'm purely uh, doing volunteer work and I'm, you know, practicing my, my day job in California. That may change for too long, but certainly I'd like to see more folks who do work entirely on renewables or at least make it a big part of their practice here in Hawaii. Don't you think there's um, a likelihood, at least in, in, in your practice, your future, whether it be as a volunteer or as a practicing lawyer, um, for a law firm uh, that does what you are doing or want to do, uh, a law firm that would advance uh, green energy all over town and write uh, power production uh, agreements um, and, um, and you know, uh, advocate uh, in various places for green energy and like not to take wooden nickels to move the needle ahead all the time, a law firm mm -hmm. that would be a, an environmental activist law firm. Isn't there room for that? Could that happen? Would you be part of that? There is, yeah. And I certainly would like to be more involved with like kind of people in Hawaii. Um, you know, there are some great groups doing advocacy, you know, Blue Planet, Ulupono, Sierra Club, um, doing great work, but they don't have the funding for uh, full-time lawyers. You know, it's just, it's an issue. Um, even nonprofit lawyers aren't cheap. Um, and so, you know, Hawaii is ahead of the curve in many ways, but it's also behind the curve in other ways. And having a, a thriving, vibrant nonprofit sector is a way, uh, when I compare it to my work in California, Hawaii could use a lot of improvement. Yeah, who knows? Maybe that's part of the conservation core, you know, one element of it. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, hiring <laughs> lawyers. <laughs> sure. Lawyers practicing <laughs> conservation. Tam Hunt, uh, a lawyer who is doing very good work on the Big Island and has great initiatives and advancing great ideas for clean energy there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tam.